All right? That's good. I almost want to stand up here for a second. Feels kind of funny, eh? All right, rock star over back to earth. So here we go. I hope everyone's having a good night. Uh, Pastor John and Donna aren't with us. They are away uh, getting ready for general conference in Ottawa. And um, with Pastor John being the district superintendent, there's a lot of meetings and stuff that happen a little bit before the conference. So I think he's going to be quite busy. And so keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And hopefully they get some rest while they're there too. Amen? So we're back into Jude. And um, we've titled this little mini-series within our Jude series, The Three Things That Can Mess You Up Big Time. And tonight we're going to look at part three. And so just to give you like a really fast recap... In the first series, we looked at Cain, and we looked at what Cain's problem was. And Cain's problem was this thing we call envy, right? Cain was so focused on what he didn't have or the lack thereof of what God gave him, and he was so focused on what God gave to everyone else that he was unable to see what God wanted to do through him. You know what I mean? And it led him to all sorts of things. He became the first murderer, and it led him down a path he didn't want to walk down. And so Cain was messed up. He was tripped up big time by this thing called envy. Um, A couple weeks ago, we talked about this guy named Balaam. And Balaam's problem was he was always out there for personal profit or for personal benefit. Balaam never really did anything without thinking, well, how can I benefit from this? Or what can I get out of this? Or maybe I could leverage God to hold out for more money for me, right? He was all about personal benefit, personal profit, and he wasn't necessarily sincere in his devotion and in his worship to God. And so therefore, um, Jude tells us not to follow such an example. And the third example that Jude gives us tonight is of this person named Korah, and his issue was rebellion. And so tonight we're going to kind of talk about rebellion and what that looks like. What does rebellion look like in our context? Well, I can think of a couple occasions in the last year or two just that are kind of a fresh right now. Anyone remember when that team from BC lost the Stanley Cup final, game seven at home? Anyone remember that? I think, what's their names? The Vancouver Canucks? No, the Vancouver Canucks. Sorry, I messed that one up a little bit. My apologies for that. But um, anyone remember when that happened and they just started looting the streets and rioting and whatnot? They're still talking about it all the time on the radio. Um, apparently 85 arrests as of yesterday, 20-some still possibly coming. The amount of money that went in that investigation was crazy. But they had to do it because they had to set a precedence that this kind of rebellion, this kind of rioting is not going to be acceptable, right? I don't know if anyone watches the CBC National or the, the news at nighttime, but if you have, you might have noticed the riots that are currently happening with students in Montreal. Anyone seen that? right? Tuition is hiking up over there about 20 percent and like they're they're literally rioting. The police are out in full force. They're smashing things and there's just a, a bit of like an outward rebellion that's happening over in Montreal. But friends, I would suggest this, that in some ways, in some ways, rebellion seems to be a part of our natural makeup. You know, you take kids, for example, right? They have a natural tendency to want to do things their own way, right? And if they don't, they can sometimes throw tantrums, you know, throw fits, right? They can complain. You know, maybe that describes us as adults sometimes a bit as well, right? (laughs) There's this natural desire within us to kind of want to do things our way and have it our way. And so in some ways, I think rebellion's been with us since the garden, right? Since the man and the woman chose the fruit over God's will, over his preference for them. And so, you know, we, we have to know and I think we have to be realistic of the fact that none of us are immune from that type of behavior, And that has to keep us humble, doesn't it? And that has to keep us dependent upon God to keep us from going our own way. And from keeping us from going ways that are going to lead to to death and not to life, right? Um, James Dean. Anyone ever heard of James Dean before, right? He's kind of like, you know, an an icon for rebellion. I remember when I was back in, in college, I had a buddy in the first year. We had to wear suits to church. You know, I was kind of thankful that ended, right? But we had to wear that in our first year. We had to wear suits to church. And I remember my one buddy used to always wear this black dress shirt, and I think just to sort of be a bit of a rebel, a rebel because he had to wear, a, you know, a dress clothes to church, he wore a James Dean tie, right, with his black shirt. And it was interesting, and I, it's, just, it's just funny seeing this guy walking around with the James Dean tie. Now, James Dean's most famous movie was a movie called Rebel Without a Cause. And when I was studying that a little bit this past week, many psychologists to this day have gone on to say that that movie perfectly describes what we now know as teenage angst. And, and they said it's really helped us kind of figure out a lot of things and how, how, how a lot of people think. And he was a very popular fellow in the eyes of some. Very popular fellow to this day in the eyes of some. But re- rebellion, with or without cause, is an issue that God takes seriously. 
and he takes it quite seriously in his word, especially when it's done with an attitude of anger or when it's done with hate or when it's done with vengeance or when it's done, you know, with self-benefit or, you know, w wanting to better yourself and, you know, make it worse for others, you know. You can't defeat rebellion with a rebellious attitude. How many of you know that? And you can't defeat corruption with corruption. And so we do so, we defeat these things, friends, with an attitude of dependence on the Father and with an attitude of love. And so let's look at Jude 11 tonight. If you want to open your Bibles, a lot of you probably know we're already heading here. Here's what Jude says. He says, Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, just to kind of make this just a little bit easier for you to understand, it's almost like Jude is taking them down memory lane here. He's recalling some stories from the past. He's recalling things that people would have known quite well. When, when they spoke of these three guys, everyone immediately would have probably know, known who it was he was speaking of and what he meant by this, you know? And what would be the equivalent names in our, in, in our era or in our time, right? You know, if, if I said the words, the names Hitler or Bin Laden or, you know, Kony, right? That, 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 that's been very much in the spotlight lately. Or Koresh or something like that. We would immediately be like, ah, right? And we would take note and we would sense the seriousness of these stories. We would sense the seriousness of what it was that these people taught people to do, led people down, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what Jude's trying to do here. He's trying to catch them and he's trying to do it with a little bit of a punch here. And he's naming three people who they all would have known, they all would have been familiar with, all for the wrong reasons. And so that's kind of what's happening here. And so we have to find out a little bit about this guy named Korah. Let me just read you a couple verses from the book of Numbers. And I'll explain the story to you. But the first, three, the, the first three verses say this. It says, Korah, son of Izhar. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. The son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Rubenites, Dathan and Abram, sons of Eliab, and on son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders, who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? And so what's happening here is Korah and his guys, he's on the scene with some of his supporters, and they're basically challenging the leadership, Moses and Aaron here. And they weren't just leadership because they self-appointed themselves as leadership, but God established them as leadership. And so they're rising up and saying, you know, basically, you know, you've gone too far. All of us should have a say. All of us should be able to, you know, maybe take the lead here. Why just you guys? You know, why do you get to be ahead of us all? You know? And then they start complaining, and it's the usual complaints that you often heard from Israel, right? Like, why did you lead us into this desert to die of thirst and hunger? Why did you bring us out here and now we're kind of lost and we don't really know what to do? And so Moses kind of reminds them. He kind of says to them, you know what? God has actually given you guys a special place, the Levites. He's actually given you guys a special place, right? But you only get what God gives to you. A man can only receive what is given to him from heaven. And it's interesting because they start to grumble against Moses. They start to grumble against Aaron. And they start to get the whole community murmuring and grumbling. And essentially what the Old Testament tells us is when they're grumbling against Moses and Aaron, they're essentially grumbling against God. Because it's God who put them on earth to be his representatives. And so what eventually happens, if you read the rest of the story, judgment happens and many people die in this story. And a great lesson is learned here. And so you could check that out later on in Numbers chapter 16 read through that but that's the gist of the story eventually judgment ends up happening and it's very 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 clear in the story that this was a lesson there was judgment because they disobeyed God and so Jude is reminding believers of this he's teaching them of rebellion and the consequences that happened because of it and he's want, wanting these false teachers he's wanting these people these innocent people in church to be mindful of this and to take it very seriously and so there's a couple forms of rebellion. When we talk about a rebellion, there's two forms that I want to bring up tonight. The first form of rebellion, rebellion, sorry, that we're going to look at is overt rebellion. All right? Overt. This is seen outwardly. It's not hidden. It's not meant to be kept secret. But it's purposely made public. It's purposely put out there. 
so that people can see it and so that people can see what it is that you're rebelling against or what you're pushing for, whether that's change or whether that's the removal of someone from leadership, et cetera, et cetera. You catch my drift on that, right? And so it's, it's, it's overtly, it's done publicly, it's done on purpose. And its consequences are typically seen outwardly as well, whether that's arrests, whether that's, you know, physical pain or some sort of physical arrest or, you know, some sort of physical force used to stop this rebellion. But there's a certain type of rebellion that it's just overt. It's done in the public. It's, no one's hiding anything. They're doing it on purpose. But there's a second type of rebellion that also happens as well. And this one we probably don't pay as much attention to, but there's covert rebellion as well. Covert, concealed done kind of in secret, right? This isn't seen outwardly, and yet it's very alive in the hearts of many people. And I may even go so far as to suggest tonight that it's, it could possibly be more dangerous to rebel this way because you may or may not be fully aware of your behavior or of your rebellion yourself. It could be something that kind of lives dormant in your heart and you don't necessarily acknowledge it. It's there, but maybe you don't even recognize it. It's concealed, it's done in secret. And its consequences at times are seen outwardly in behaviors and in actions. But much of the time, much of the time, it, you know, it, it, it's not covert rebellion and it, its consequences are, sorry, it is covert rebellion. Its consequences are seen inwardly and they happen on the inside. And sometimes it causes strains in our relationship with God. Sometimes it causes strains in our relationship with other people and it breaks them. In some cases, it can, it can sever our relationship with God because if we're pushing our agenda, if we're pushing our ways and our purposes over His, that can really strengthen the relationship. How many of you know that? Right? And so its effects can sometimes be seen outwardly, but very much it could happen on the inside. And so this leads us to a couple of contrasting traits that are seen in people who rebel or in people who choose to submit. And these two traits are pride and humility. And so what will we choose? Will you choose the way of pride or will you change, choose the way of humility? And so let's talk about humility for a couple of minutes here. Humility has three aspects. The first aspect of humility that I want to talk about tonight is our obedience to God. Our obedience to God. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Is the Lord someone that we submit to? Do we trust his ways? Do we trust his will for us? And Larry Moore was with us a couple months ago, and he was in here speaking at a weekend of prayer and fasting. And I remember he was going on about relevancy and this idea of being relevant to our culture. And he was talking about how, you know, it's good to be relevant. You know, don't, don't get me wrong, being relevant has its place. But something he said that really stuck with me that night was something that I believe is true. In, in a lot of ways, relevancy a lot of the time is overrated, right? Because God desires his, what God's looking for, what God wants is people who aren't just relevant, but people who will be obedient to his will and to his word and to what he wants, who puts him and puts the kingdom first. That's what God's looking for. Looking for. And friends, there's an attitude of humility that happens when we obey him, when we trust him. Number two, another aspect of humility is our complete and utter dependence upon God. Our complete and utter dependence upon him. James 4, 6 says it like this. It says, but God, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God opposes, opposes the proud. That's a tough, that's, that's kind of a tough teaching, isn't it? It's difficult. Friends, and being humble is about trusting God, and it's about knowing that we don't have it all together. How many of us in here recognize our limitations? We all have them. We have limitations. And being prideful, sometimes it, 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 it kind of exhibits itself in believing too much in ourselves or in our own opinions or in our own strength. And in many cases, we overstep that way when we act in pride. You know, we become the ones in charge, and a lot of the time we leave God's will and his desires kind of by the wayside. And scripture seems to indicate that it's possible, it's possible to live in this place where God kind of opposes your way of life or your behavior. And friends, that's not a place any of us want to live in tonight, amen? Right? God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it doesn't even just say grace. I love that first line. He gives us more grace, right? He gives us grace because grace helps us to live the way he wants us to live. Third aspect of humility tonight that we're going to look at 
is our view of ourselves. How do we view ourselves? How, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself, as the Bible says, with sober judgment? Do you, do you look at yourself with realistic lens? Or do you maybe hold yourself up high? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says something here that I think is quite actually quite helpful. He says this, he says, For I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. That grace did a changing power in his life. And then he says, no, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And I came across this verse this past week, and it stuck out to me, because friends, we're not talking about false humility tonight. All right? We're not talking about like a false humility who sits there and says, yeah, no, I don't do anything. I'm terrible, you know, and you just deflect everything. Anyone know what I'm talking about? There, there could be an attitude of false humility when you know you did something well, but you start acting like you didn't do it well, and, and, and you're sort of wanting people to praise you. Anyone know where I'm going here? And it's neat because the apostle here starts off this whole thing by talking about because of his persecution of the church, how he's the least of the apostles. He doesn't even deserve to be called one. But then he goes on, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And, I like, and, he, and he doesn't deny the fact that, yes, he did work harder than all of them. That did happen. But yet it wasn't him. It was the grace of God that was with him that empowered him to do that. And he had this realistic judgment. He had this good view of himself. I remember when I was in grade six art class, there was this kid in my class who was amazingly gifted. I might have told you guys this before. And many people would compliment his work. And, and, and he, he would just do the best paintings, the best drawings, the best anything. And people would give him compliments, and he'd look at us and be like, no, it's ugly, or it's terrible. And, you know, he, he, he didn't really know how to respond to that, except for he would start to, you know, clearly say that it wasn't very good. And eventually, after a few months of this, it got to a point when this kid, his name was Dustin, he started to parade around the class with his work, and he continually was telling people how terrible it was, how it didn't work out. Friends, that's, that's false humility, right? He knew it wasn't terrible. He knew it was good, and he wanted to get a pat on the shoulder. So we're not talking, there's a difference here. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Right? It's a difference between humility and false humility. You know, and pride is the opposite of humility. You see, being humble isn't about having low self-esteem or deflecting credit when credit is due, but it's modeled by knowing that you, in fact, did do well, but you reflect the credit to the one who's able to help you do well, right? The one who gives you ability to do well by pointing to him. And pride is the opposite of humility in all three of these areas. Pride says, I don't need to obey God because I'll do things my way. Pride says, I don't need to be dependent upon God. I'm strong enough, I'm talented enough to take care of things myself. You know, and pride says, I've got it all together, and I'm this much above others, so I don't need to worry about anything. And you trust in yourself a little too much. When I was thinking about this, I wrote down a couple of thoughts, and I even wrote down this. I wrote, how many athletes have destroyed their reputation?" have destroyed their career or destroyed their teams because of the sin known as pride and wanting to put the attention on themselves and wanting to put the focus on themselves and wanting everything to be about them. You see it in sports all the time, don't you? Right? How many times have we refused help or avoided others because we allow pride to convince us that we can do everything on our own and we're too proud to ask for help and we're too proud to accept things when people bring them to us or try to help us? And we only hurt ourselves in the end. Pride leads us to a place that could, you know, be somewhat destructive. You know, and even scarier, I guess, how many times have we allowed pride or self-dependence to take us away from living out God's will, right? And trying to live out our own. Or maybe even worse, trying to make our own His will. <laughs> Try to get Him to bless what it is we think he, we want to do, right? Rather than what He wants us to do. And so prideful living or rebellious living, as we've seen in the case of Korah, it leads to all sorts of things. But another thing it led to was this, this word called grumbling. It learned, led to this thing called grumbling or murmuring, or, or some of us in here might know it as gossip, right? It led to stuff like this as well. Um, anyone ever heard of Jack Welch before? He's the CEO of General Electric. He's kind of a, a, a business guy. He writes books. He speaks at lots of seminars. He often goes to these catalyst seminars that um, the Christians in America put on. And um, I don't know a whole lot about Jack, but I, I remember watching a video. Pastor John showed us one because he was giving, us a, giving a video or a talk at a conference about team building and what that looks like and you know, how that plays out and how that gets better. And one thing Jack said was he said, nothing is worse than negative energy in the workplace. 
How many of you know that to be true? Right? In your places at work. All right? I, I, I see some amens here. I think you're all with me here, right? You know, negative people disrupt and destroy good work. Plain and simple. That's how Jack put it. That's how he felt. And he, 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 he said this. He said, the hallway whisperer is absolutely deadly and destructive to the workplace. He calls it the hallway whisperer, right? And friends, I think there's some truth to this in the church as well. I don't think we should just limit this to the workplace. You see, he said the key to a team's or to any company's success is to prevent the meetings that happen after the meeting, right? You get into your group, you get into your team, you have your meeting, but you don't see everything eye to eye, and you don't agree on everything. And so what do you do? Once the meeting's over, you kind of go behind the back and have little meetings everywhere, right? And it's completely destructive to the goal and to the mission of the team and to the group. And I don't think that's too far off from the church either, friends. I think the same principles kind of apply there. You know, the conversations in the coffee room, the meetings after the meetings, the gossip, the murmuring, the grumbling, call it what you want to call it. The Bible instructs us to do all you can to prevent such things from even happening, from even starting, from even occurring. And so how do we do murmuring? Do we encourage discussion behind leaders' backs? Do we encourage critical spirits? Right? I think it's good advice for all of us that we must pay attention to the temptation when it comes to try to do this and to resist that because nothing can bring down team. Nothing can bring down a group of people united more than stuff like this, right? And we see it happening all the time. And was this ever a problem in the church? Do we have this problem in the church nowadays? In the book of Titus, we're writing here to a, a young pastor in the faith. In Titus 1, 10 to 11, it says this. It says, for there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruin ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. And so the Bible, friends, it tells us to do everything in love and in decency. And friends, that, that goes for the times when we have disagreements as well, amen? It goes for those times as well. Disagreeing with someone means, when we, means, means sometimes that we maybe need to speak with them and deal with it properly. It doesn't mean that we go campaigning. It doesn't mean that we go gossiping. It doesn't mean that we go have a bunch of meetings after the meeting and try to bring people down. We have to prevent from that. If you disagree with or if you have a problem with someone, a good place to start may be just, just to pray. Why not pray for them? Jesus always told us to do that. And if it's within the realm of possibility for the two of you to meet up and chat, then make sure that you do it. And if not, if that's not possible, if maybe the person you have a disagreement with lives in Southern America and you only disagree with something they said on a podcast or something like that, well, just chill and be calm and know that God will eventually sort this all out. Amen? He's big enough to do that. Here's a liberating truth, friends, and I've said this before. None of us in here tonight need to be God's general manager, right? None of us in here need to do that. He's got it covered. He can take care of things. We can trust that he's going to sort things out properly. And there are a way to approach leaders, right? When I was thinking about this this past week, and we were talking about this in the sermon meeting, and one thing we talked about as a general rule is to make sure that we never complain about something if you're not willing to be a part of the solution. If you're not willing to help, if you're not willing to roll up your sleeves and help, then quit the complaining, right? You know, but sometimes people complain about everything and anything just for the sake of it. And because it's not their preference or because we didn't choose something or because they didn't think it up first, right? And it turns into grumbling and complaining. And over time, it gets through a bunch of people. And before you know it, you've caused a whole bunch of negativity for nothing, right? And the Bible gives us models for dealing with disagreement. If you want to study this further, read through Paul's books on Corinthians. Read through that. He addresses this quite a bit to this church, right? And he gives them in-depth instruction on how to deal with it. But talking behind the back of someone, gossip, stirring up trouble, is not what the Bible calls for. In fact, you're going to find out that it speaks strongly against such behavior. And so when you disagree with someone, a good place to start is to maybe stop, pray, go to God, pray for them. Maybe speak in privately with them. Maybe speak in privately with them and another trusted person, right? Do things with, you know, love, honor them. Do things with respect, amen? That's what the Bible calls us to. 
often the problem, friends, and where things get really messy sometimes is a lot of the time this route isn't chosen, right? And like I said, it becomes about gossip. It becomes about, you know, talking behind backs, campaigning to turn others against someone, right? It causes grumbling, causes bad attitudes. And friends, it's not a stretch for me to suggest tonight that both Old Testament and New Testament scripture show us that God doesn't look too fondly on such behavior. He never has. In fact, it's out of place for his people to behave in such a way. He warns us not to. And he warns those who choose to behave in that ungodly matter that you will face consequences for your actions. We're not fooling anyone, right? Let's look at one more scripture on leadership here in Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse 17. The writer of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. And so finally, friends, we need to recognize that it's God who puts people in positions of authority. And these people are actually there for our benefit, right? They're there to help us. They're there to help lead us. And and biblically, they're supposed to be there selflessly, right? Wanting to do what God wants to do. And want, wanting to lead that through. And we need to encourage them and, and, and bless them, right? Because we, how many of you know in this room tonight that we're all under some form of authority, aren't we? Right? Whether it's at work, whether it's, whether it's you know, here, whether it's, you know, whether it's with Jesus. We're all ultimately under his authority, amen? Every single one of us. You know? I have a boss, right? Pastor John's a district superintendent. And there's people over him, right? And there's just a line of authority that happens. We see this in everywhere of life. And we need to respect that. And we need to bless our leadership and, and, and lift them up and encourage them. You know, if leaders are for our benefit, we must recognize that leaders themselves also, as it says in the scripture, they're men who are going to have to give account to God. So God will sort this stuff out, right? God will, the, God, God will figure it out. He'll take care of it. We don't have to be his general managers. He's got it covered. Right? And what we need to do, friends, is we need to worry about our own lives and make sure that we're living the lives that God's called us to live, amen? The lives that Christ has called us to. Loving Him and loving each other. And trying to keep the unity of the Spirit. And so I'll just comment on a couple of quick things here before we go. In conclusion, three things that can mess us up big time. With Cain, we've seen that it's this thing called envy. With Balaam, we've seen that it's this thing called personal profit, right? And with Korah, we see that rebellion can really mess us up. We don't keep it in check. And so the principle for us tonight as we think about these things is that people who live this way or people who teach others to live this way or who lead others astray and have a tendency to tear down rather than build up the body of Christ, these are the people we shouldn't be trying to model our lives after. Amen? Right? God's calling us to so much more than this. And friends, as the body of Christ, we need each other. Amen? We need each other. And I I love that we use the illustration as a body because each part of the body plays a part. You've probably heard it said before, the arms need the legs, right? The eyes need the feet. I know that was a weird one, but you know, they all need each other, right? (laughs) We need each other. And so for everything to function, the full health, and you know, as God has arranged it, we need to make sure that we're doing our part to keep the unity, right? and to build each other up. Mutual edification. You know, we must never put ourselves in a position or live in a place where we can cause division or some sort of destruction to the body. It's far too precious to God. It's far too important to Him. Right? We must never put ourselves in a position where our personal agendas get ahead of of those of the body of Christ. Right? We've got to protect against that. And thankfully, friends, I see a lot of this good stuff lived out at Lawson. I commend you tonight, right? And we've got to protect the unity that we have here, amen? We've got to keep that unity. We have to make sure that we don't turn into people who are having all sorts of meetings after the meeting or becoming hallway whisperers, right? We have to make sure we speak good of each other, love each other, build each other up. That's what God's plan for our church is. And I want to commend you. I see lots of that here all the time. It's awesome to be a part of that. So let's make a commitment to keep that. There's a bit of a scary verse here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and this will be the last verse that I show tonight. But a lot of people take this verse, and they think that when it says God's temple, it's actually talking about, like, you know, my personal body. 
If you want that interpretation, go to 1 Corinthians 6, I think it is. You'll find that. But here, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul is talking about divisions in the body of Christ. And he says this. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Talking about the church. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred. And you are that temple. So serious words, right? Serious words so that we will take serious the responsibility to edify each other. We'll take serious the responsibility to love each other and to love our leadership and to bless them. Amen? And I know it sounds funny, maybe, coming from someone up here, right? But we're all under some form of authority, right? And we all have a responsibility to bless and love our leadership. And so, Lawson, here's my challenge tonight. Let's once again, afresh in our hearts, make a commitment not to ever let ourselves live in pride or rebellion or by grumbling, but let's make a commitment to keep the unity of the body, amen? And to walk in humility with one another and walk together as we serve God, as we love people, as we go out in our community and do his work, amen? We need to make that commitment afresh. And with such a people, Christ is pleased. And so Jude tells us, these guys, these three dudes we're talking about, they seem to lead people down paths they shouldn't go. They seem to push people down paths. Friends, let's, let's stay away from that, right? And let's follow Jesus together. And let me pray for us tonight as we do that. Father, I just um, thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. And God, that it has power, Lord, to help us to see how great you are and how little we are, Father. How awesome you are. How perfect you are. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us, Lord, imperfect people. Help us, Father, just to keep unity in this house. Help us to love each other. Help us, Lord, just to not grumble and complain, Lord, but help us just to keep our eyes focused in on you and on all that you have us to do. So, God, we just pray, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord God, that you love us so much this week. And help each one of us, Lord God, as we just continue to walk with you to learn more and to grow more every day. Father, I just thank you for Pastor John and for Donna, Lord, great leadership you put over us. I pray that you would just be with them, Lord God, as they're away in Ottawa, that they would get some rest and that they would just get refreshed in you as well. And so, Father, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you that you love us, God. Thank you that you give us extra grace, Lord, to live in such a way. Thank you that you have much patience with us. And, Father, help us to obey you, help us to depend on you, and help us to have a realistic view of ourselves. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, amen. So I leave you with that tonight. Think about these things and make every effort, friends, to keep the body united. Amen? Quick little reminder, no one mentioned this yet, and for some odd reason, and I don't think about this stuff during sermons usually, but next week is Mother's Day weekend, am I correct? So what happens on Saturday night, every Mother's Day weekend, is our annual men pie baking competition, right? So men, there's the challenge. Bake a pie this week and bring it in next Saturday, and there will be a little competition to see, see who can bake the best pie from scratch. And afterwards, I believe we're going to have like a little pie and coffee fellowship just kind of in the foyer. And so there, just remember that. Make sure you do that. Have a great week, folks.